This video is part one of a review of AP Precalculus Topics 1.1 through 1.3, which is primarily about rate of change. Number one, the table gives the average rates of change of a function f over different intervals. On which of the intervals does the function increase the most? The rate of change over an interval is just the slope of the segment from the beginning of the interval to the end of the interval. That means the rate of change will be the change in y divided by the change in x. And I'm sure you won't mind if I flip that equation around the other way. Now the increase of the function is the change in y. So let's rewrite this equation so that the change in y is by itself. We can do that by multiplying both sides of the equation by the delta x in the bottom. We end up with delta y equals delta x times the average rate of change. In other words, the increase of the function for a particular interval is the width of the interval times the rate of change. This will be useful because we have both of those pieces of information. Uh, for example, for the first interval, we see that the width of the interval, well, from zero to four, that's a width of four. So that's delta x. If we multiply that by the rate of change that they gave us, we get 12. So that is the increase of the function for this interval. That's delta y. Let's do the same for the next interval. It's going to be delta x times the rate of change. From four to five, the width of this interval is one. And then, of course, we see the rate of change is nine. One times nine is nine. That's the function increase for this interval, the change in y. For the next interval, the width of the interval from five to seven, that's two multiplied times the rate of change, that is negative 14. This is a decrease of 14. We want the interval that has the greatest increase, so we know that's not gonna be it. And for the last interval, the width of the interval from seven to 10, that's three, 10 minus seven, times the rate of change of five, which is 15. So we have calculated delta y, the function increase for each interval, and it turns out to be 12, 9, negative 14, and 15. So obviously 15 is the greatest increase of the function, which happened in the interval from seven to 10. That's why the answer to number one would be D. Number two, the table describes the behavior of a function f for selected intervals of x. On what interval is the rate of change of f positive and increasing? Pause the screen and copy this chart down. I want you to memorize the graphical relationships between f, the rate of change of f, and the rate of change of the rate of change. On your next test or quiz, I want you to quickly write this on a piece of scratch paper and then have it next to you. It will help you answer many questions. Next year in calculus, we will use a slightly different version of this throughout the course. It's so important. This symbol right here stands for concave up. So for example, when f of x is concave up, its rate of change is increasing and the rate of change of the rate of change is positive. That's how you read the chart. We are looking for an interval where the rate of change of f is positive and increasing. According to the chart, if the rate of change is positive, that means f is increasing. So we need an interval where f is going to be increasing. If the rate of change is increasing, then f is concave up. So we're looking for an interval where f is increasing and concave up. And we see on the interval from two to three, f is concave up and increasing. So the answer is A. Number three, the average rate of change of the quadratic function P is 16 on the interval from two to four and 11 on the interval from four to six. 
what is the average rate of change of p on the interval from 8 to 10? This is another chart that I would like you to memorize, so definitely pause the screen and write this down. But for this problem, focus on the part that says when f of x is quadratic, then the rate of change of the rate of change is constant. Let's organize our thoughts by writing down the x values for each interval. So the first interval goes from 2 to 4. So let's just write down a 2 and a 4. And then we have another interval from 4 to 6. So I've already got the 4, so there's my 6. And we want the average rate of change on the interval from 8 to 10. So notice that we have 2, 4, 6. These are all going up by 2s. So um, even though it wasn't mentioned, I'm going to need to think about the interval from 6 to 8 in the middle. And then we get to the interval from 8 to 10. We are told that the rate of change is 16 on the interval from 2 to 4. So here's my interval from 2 to 4, and I'm just going to record the rate of change right here as 16. Rate of change here. And then we are told that the rate of change is 11 on the interval from 4 to 6. So on the interval from 4 to 6, the rate of change is 11. We are being asked to somehow find the rate of change on the interval from 8 to 10. But remember, this chart tells us that if f of x is quadratic, then the rate of change of the rate of change is constant. So let's look at how the rate of change is changing. From 16 to 11, the rate of change is decreasing by 5. And since this function is quadratic, we know that the rate of change of the rate of change is constant. In other words, the rate of change should decrease by 5 uh, for every equal interval. So if we look at the interval from 6 to 8, the rate of change should decrease by 5 again. From 11, if we decrease by 5, that brings us to 6. The last interval is the one we really wanted to know about. And the rate of change should decrease by 5 again from 6 to 1. So the rate of change on the interval from 8 to 10 is 1. And the answer is A. I just realized that these arrows make it look like this is a jump of 16, a jump of 11, a jump of 6, and a jump of 1, which clearly is not the case, so that could be confusing. So, I think it will be less confusing if I use brackets like this instead. I'll save the arrows for jumps. Number 4, f of x is a linear function. Find the value of k. Let's look at this chart again. On the previous problem, f of x was quadratic, so the rate of change of the rate of change was constant. On this problem, f of x is linear, so the rate of change itself will be constant. Let's record all of the changes in the input values. From negative 2 to 3, that's an increase of 5. From 3 to 5, that's an increase of 2. And from 5 to 8, that's an increase of 3. Looking at the change in output values, we see that from 18 to 3 is a decrease of 15. Since the changes in the input values are not the same, we can't use the shortcut of just looking at the change in output values and looking for a constant change in output values. We need to actually calculate the rate of change. And negative 15 is not the actual rate of change on the interval from negative 2 to 3. We have to do the change in y divided by the change in x. In other words, for the actual rate of change on this interval, I think I'll label it up here like this, we have to do negative 15 divided by 5. So the rate of change is negative 3. Remember that since f of x is linear, 
the rate of change is constant. So for the next interval from three to five, the rate of change should again be negative three. So since the rate of change has to end up being negative three, what does the change in output values have to be? Well, to get the rate of change, we do the change in output divided by the change in input. We see the two right here, and we need the fraction, the division, to give us a negative three. So the change in output must be negative six, because negative six divided by two would give us the negative three that we need. So negative six has to be the change in these output values, but that's going to tell us what k is. Starting from three, if we decrease by six, that's going to leave us with k equals negative three. And that's the answer to number four. For number five, we have two separate tasks. Given this table of values of x and k of x, we're going to decide whether k of x could be linear, quadratic, or neither. And we will also decide whether the function could be concave up, concave down, or neither. Either way, we should start by recording the changes in input values and the changes in output values. The input values are changing by two for every interval. Here are the corresponding changes in the output values. Since the changes in the input values are all the same, we can use a shortcut and just look at the changes in the output values. Uh, we don't need to actually calculate the rate of change. We don't need to do negative one divided by two and negative two divided by two in order to answer these questions. For example, we can see that the output changes are decreasing. And since the input changes are all the same, if the output changes are decreasing, that means that the overall rate of change is decreasing. That means f of x is concave down. So the answer to this side is b. Turning our attention to the other side, if k of x was linear, then the rate of change would be constant and all of these values would be the same. So it's not linear, we can cross it out. According to this chart, if f of x is quadratic, then the rate of change of the rate of change will be constant. So we need to calculate and see how the rate of change is changing. We can see that the output values are changing by different amounts. These are not the rates of change, but since the input intervals are all the same, if the output values are changing by different amounts, we can say that the rate of change is changing by different amounts. In other words, the rate of change of the rate of change is not a constant, so this is not quadratic. So that means it's neither. For number six, the input values are all changing by two again. The output values are decreasing by 20 every time. Since the input intervals are all the same, we can use the shortcut and simply say that the rate of change is a constant. And if the rate of change is a constant, then the function is linear, meaning neither concave up nor concave down. So on the right hand side, the answer is C, and we just said that the function is linear, so that means on the left hand side, the answer is A. For number seven, we see that the input values are all increasing by four. The output values are increasing by seven, and then five, and then three, and then one. Again, since the input intervals are all the same, we can use a little shortcut and we can look at the output changes to tell us what the rate of change is actually doing. For example, we can look at these numbers and see that the rate of change is decreasing. Since the rate of change is not constant, we know that this function is not gonna be linear. We can forget about that. But 
since the rate of change is decreasing, that tells us that the function is concave down. Again, I'm thinking about this chart when I say that. If the rate of change is decreasing, then f of x is concave down. To know if the function is quadratic, we need to see if the rate of change of the rate of change is constant. We can use these numbers to decide how the rate of change is changing. So from seven to five, that's a decrease of two. And then from five to three, that's another decrease of two. And from three to one, that is again a decrease of two. So this tells us that the rate of change is changing at a constant rate. So f of x is quadratic. For number eight, we need to answer these four questions all about this graph of h. First of all, is the graph of h positive or negative? Well, the entire graph is above the x-axis. That makes the graph of h positive. Next, is the graph of h increasing or decreasing? Because h is going downhill from left to right, these, uh, the y values are falling, then it is decreasing. Is the rate of change of h positive or negative? Rate of change means the slope when you're looking at a graph. So if you make a tangent line, you can see that um, any tangent line that you draw on this graph is going to be downward sloping. That is a negative rate of change. And then for part D, is the rate of change of H increasing or decreasing? There are two ways to answer this question. You can use the chart we've been looking at, and we could, we could use the concavity. So notice that uh, this function H is concave up. Concave up means any part of an upward facing sort of bowl shape. So H is concave up. Looking at this chart, we have learned that uh, if a function is concave up, that means the rate of change is increasing. So that's one way to answer the question. Or you can do it a little bit more intuitively. Uh, it looks like I've drawn this tangent line just about at a 45 degree, degree angle. That would make this slope, this rate of change, a negative one. Let's put a couple more tangent lines on here. This blue tangent line is very steep, but it's negative. Let's estimate that it is about negative two. This red tangent line is a lot less steep, but still negative. Let's estimate negative one half. So as we go from left to right, the slopes are going from negative two to negative one to negative one half. These numbers are getting less negative. If you put them on a number line, they would be lined up from left to right, from negative two to negative one to negative one half. These values are increasing. So that's another way to think about it. This video is long enough, so let's save number nine for part two. I'll see you over there.